Okay, welcome to Three Dudes in a Dock. I'm Tyler. I'm joined by Mitch and Christian as usual. Say hi, boys. Okay, so this week we uh, we watched Rip, a remix manifesto. Um, yeah, so it's uh, basically a, a 2008, uh, they call it an open source documentary. Um, yeah. So uh, basically uh, the director created a website and allowed people to go in and uh, add footage, edit footage. Um, mm-hmm. So being that we're kind of in the content creation uh, realm, uh, Mitch, yeah. what did you think about it uh, off the top? Oh, it was it was awesome, man. And just um, conversations that we've had past podcasts of it's kind of difficult to find them for like legal reasons or like copyright in different countries. And like it's pretty cool that this one was like on YouTube, like the whatever the Canadian Film Board, like their YouTube page, it's on there. So was, the first thing that I kind of thought and made me chuckle was it would be funny if this was like really hard for us to find. Like it's behind like paywalls and stuff when the whole thing is about how that sucks. And a lot of it was um, like, did you guys know who Girl Talk was? I had no idea. No. Yeah. No, I like I knew who he was because um, I listened to it in college. And there's a bunch of other dudes like Hood Internet is kind of the same thing where they just mash crazy popular songs together and there's a bunch of rappers that do it too like jay electronica did it with like he does it with like movie scores and like lines from like there's a really cool song where he takes lines from the old willy wonka on the chocolate factory like when gene wilder's freaking out and it just works really well but like putting that on an album you're like oh yeah there's no way that like so many people own this shit so it's crazy. Yeah. So copyright something that you and I went through school uh, for mm-hmm. television and we learned a little bit about copyright. Um, but admittedly, yeah. like, I didn't uh, know a whole hell of a lot about it. Yeah. And what was funny was when we were in school, um, the Canadian copyright was written in like the 1910s or the 1920s. So like every new media that has been invented then, there's literally no law. So it was just such a wide open market and i think a lot of that's changed now obviously with pressure from the u.s where they're like hey you gotta get your shit together with like be play like be on our side yeah so christian uh how did this change your perspective on copyright or uh um i don't think it changed my perspective on copyright um it changed my perspective on content creation not like digitally just in general i guess art to get real blunt um i what hit me most was his adherence to that this was a unique and novel creation i i honestly don't agree um i think this music is catchy and it it sounds good to listen to and it's really interesting and it's creative it it really is kind of a first of its kind Specifically, girl talk. I'm not talking about uh, other kinds of sampling. Like Jay Electronica sampling is mm-hmm. far more reasonable than what girl talk does. But it changed my perspective on on art creation, the, the creative process, and mm-hmm. and I I don't agree with not giving credit to the artist, and that's kind of my only sticking point with this. I listened to this, uh, like I, I listened to this, I watched this um, on YouTube, <laughs> on the Canadian Film Board channel. So that was that was pretty cool that it was easily accessible, especially for Canadians, because, mm-hmm. we've, yeah, we've had problems with that in the past. Um, overall, um, it, yeah, it didn't really change my opinion too much on, on copyright, like the actual uh, topic of this mm-hmm. documentary. Like everyone else, I'm assuming, I don't really know a ton about copyright. Um, I've yeah. gotten letters from uh, Warner Brother Pictures oh, about man. downloading movies before. So. I've, I've always wanted one of those. Yeah, it's super scary if you don't know what it means. But if you yeah. just dig a little bit deeper, it's complete fucking bullshit. And yeah. there's not much that can happen. So copyright-wise, I mean, I'm on YouTube every 
day and mm. other places to get music. Um, I don't really use Spotify, but uh, yeah, this this was a cool documentary to learn more about it because it it seems like it's still such a gray area, and that's well hard to believe just because yeah. there's there's so much content and there's so much. Uh, lawmaking you'd think that they would have come to a conclusion by now but it seems like each step the creators take lawmakers make that same step in the mirror and it just it's a complete dance and it really sucks for the artists because girl talk actually is like you know makes some catchy music and Yeah. yeah i would listen to it uh happily if i were out somewhere i don't think i'd actually listen to it myself mostly honestly for the philosophical um content as to him not really giving a whole lot of credit to the artist if he were to have printed up a pamphlet (laughs) i know as lame as that sounds uh, of each artist that is featured in his set list like oh Mm -hmm. so in this song guys check out the snare hit those are from stevie wonder superstition mm-hmm. and watch out for that baseline in the second half that's from mm-hmm. uh, like somewhere over the rainbow if that was how it was structured and he didn't claim that these were his songs as girl talk because i know that they were created as such the amount of work that he puts into that is crazy <laughs> i've never done that kind of actual uh song creation work before and it it does not seem easy especially trying to float around the law in the whole process to make sure that you don't go to jail for too long um yeah there's some real work being done but Mm -hmm. honestly because he's not super open about the actual sources of his music and that it it's i don't know it's just it's just not it's not my kind of music, but not for the music. It's for the, the deeper reasons. So hitting on that, when it showed like Led Zeppelin kind of sampling like the older music, like what do you think about that then? Um, it's, a, it's a little bit different to me in the respect that when I pick up a guitar, I can, I can interpret it in a few different ways. And it really, really takes me soul. I I don't know that I want to describe what I mean by that, but if you're good at playing an instrument, um, you'll know if this was done because you stole it or if this was done because this is an honest interpretation of something that came before. Obviously the line here is like razor wire thin, (laughs) but I, I do think that there's a genuine difference in artists like Led Zeppelin hearing old tunes and mm. looking at them in a different way. And, and it's just strictly different in my opinion. Well, Zeppelin like blatantly stole a lot of shit and didn't credit people. And like so much so that there's legal cases where they have had to pay because they stole and didn't credit. Yeah. So that's like directly the same thing. So it's well, kind it's of funny. Quite. I do have an eye, like, there's more to this, obviously, but, um, so, (laughs) never once do we see Girl Talk or Greg, um, something or other, his first name is Greg, so we never see Greg as... The director? No, Girl Talk. Oh, Oh, okay, sorry, yeah, okay, you're using his real name. Um, yeah, so we never see Mr. Talk at a (laughs) local dive bar recording raw sound from an up-and-coming band. Nobody knows these people, and he really does eliminate potential success for these groups, albeit he may also boost them in their listenership because he's so popular. If he gave credit, well, then these small-time dive bar bands who nobody knows, maybe somebody would know. That's another point that he doesn't give credit, but Girl Talk uses songs and samplings that literally everybody knows. So <laughs> when you Man. say that Led Zeppelin rips off music, I ain't never heard those originals. The, oh, fact, that I, the fact that I do hear them is kind of special. 
that it comes from an uncredited source and it was kind of technically stolen, that sucks. I yeah. shame Led Zeppelin for that. But everybody knows the music that Girl Talk samples. That's why it works. They're our favorite. It's literally like music crack. It's heroin for your ears because it's the best of the best slammed together in this new way. But everything is familiar. It's like going back to an ex. You're like, ah, I know this. It's kind of boring, but it gets me going. And that's, that's the difference is because when Girl Talk uses these sound clips, really nobody is losing. These people are already famous. They're already millionaires. The fact that they're griping over it, like Lars Ulrich was from Metallica, is a fucking shame. And it's, it's different. I think Led Zeppelin's playing a different game than Girl Talk because these people have exposures. Same thing. Zeppelin just stole from poor black artists. If Led Zeppelin was around today recording and they were sampling uh, new music that, that everyone knew, like the music that they sampled was like, yeah, like a blues artist from like the, the 20s or 30s, right? Um, so obviously yeah. like yeah, they weren't so. a lot of their stuff. Yeah. They weren't, uh, widely, uh, put out there. W- would that make well, a difference? It wasn't, that, it wasn't like, it wasn't widely put out there because they weren't successful or they weren't good. It was like, it wasn't put out there because they were black musicians. Right. So that's kind of like an extra level of fuck. Yeah. And if Zeppelin was around today, like doing their thing, I feel like they would be in jail so goddamn fast. Cause there's a crazy story about one of their American North American tours where Robert Plant literally like bought this girl from her parents when she was like a teenager and then they toured around with her and he like kept her in a back room so no one was like, Whoa, that chick's like really young And then when they left North America they just like left her in like Idaho or some shit. Well, that's a that's a whole different issue. Yeah, exactly. So they're like, Oh man, there's a lot going on here with you crazy guys. <laughs> But like getting back to the copyright, like if if Zeppelin was around now and you know say sampling you know Taylor Swift or um, whoever, um, would yeah. would that make it a di- like would that make your opinion change, Christian? Um, no, <laughs> only because uh, I know for a fact that that would be a monetary deal. No fucking way would Led Zeppelin sample Taylor Swift because they thought her music was of merit and worthwhile being incorporated into their music, which I just artistically, I, maybe that question I'm maybe it was just using that as an example. Yeah. I'm just using not, not her music, but her name. Uh, Yeah. Um, would I think it was any different than what girl talk is doing? Yes. Absolutely. Like 100%. But, but why? Because first of all, Led Zeppelin has to play the instrument that they came up with, like the the music first, and then they need to sample in Taylor Swift's music. But they didn't write the music. They just know how to read music or like they know how to play it. So that would be like, I don't know. I feel like it's like the three of us shot, like reshot, um, like Goodfellas shot for shot. And we're like, we just made this movie. We should be able like. Oh, cool. so like a, a cover? I, like wow. if Led Zeppelin covered a Taylor Swift song? If it was credited, like if we just did it and we're kind of like... Exactly. Just, yeah, but they... But dude, Zeppelin stole shit and didn't credit. Like they weren't like... No, hey, when we I addressed this, that. Uh, yeah. Like, this is a cool... Yeah. I don't know. The whole thing's fucked, man. Copyright is a huge... Yeah, like you said before, yeah. a huge gray area. Like there's so much yeah. stuff that doesn't make sense and it varies from country yeah. to country. Um, like it showed in the documentary uh, that Japanese or Chinese uh, um, Disneyland. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, they couldn't. They do that with everything, though. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. eventually they closed, obviously. But, uh, but yeah, mm-hmm. they, they ran for a while. I kind of piggybacked off of uh, Disney's success. Yeah. I think there's like still fake Apple stores that look exactly like Apple stores in China. And like. And you, you'll be able, you used to be able to get fake Rolexes, like crazy cheap. So there's just like a whole, like copyright isn't really a thing in China where they're just like, oh, I don't really care. I guess in that respect, it's, for me, it's a little bit different because a Chinese Walt Disneyland, 
um, that's fine. Uh, nobody in China is going to get to go to Disneyland. That's impossible. Oh, what? Why is that impossible? Because they, they just in... don't have that kind of economy. They, Wait, they there's like a hand. <laughs> there's got to be a handful of them that can. There's like, two actual Disney perhaps. worlds in China. One in Hong Kong, one in uh, Beijing. Mm. Right, but like there's two Disneyland's in North America, and I haven't fucking been. Right, and I have a good job. I'm super duper man uh, eligible. I've got like advantages to go, and I still haven't gone, and I want to go. I, I don't think they want a single white male with no children to go there. That's not really their demographic. <laughs> I have my rights, okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> The, the, I guess, yeah, it's a slight difference. It's more of not really on topic, but for me, that's a little bit different because China, the opportunities aren't there to go to Disneyland like they are in North America or other places with Disneyland. So the fact that there's a mm-hmm. ripoff, men, you like, you might as well call it Canada's Wonderland because they have theme parks and it's cheaper. That's it's kind of, it's pretty wild how there is two real Disneylands in China because that means. Walt Disney, the company, had to sit down in a meeting with the Communist Party and we're like, all right, guys, you want to do business? We're going to do business. And like, there's no way anyone sitting like those, any of those Disney execs were like, hey, China, your human rights track record is pretty shitty. Like, what's up with that? Like, there's no fucking way. So they just be like, we're going to each get six bazillion dollars and don't worry about if um, there's like a drunk Chinese guy at the park and we shoot him in the head. There's like, this is kind of a side, side tangent, but, uh, on Disney plus there's a, uh, uh, documentary series called the Imagineering story. Um, yeah, that's just cool. And it, it talks about the, the Chinese parks. Obviously it's painted with a Disney brush. Um, yeah. so th- they don't go into communist China <laughs> and talk about that at all, but, but yeah, Imagine. It, it explains that. Okay. So, we talked about the knockoff Disney World then. So what about Disney trying to get the daycare to take uh, Disney characters off their walls? Fucking bullshit, man. That's so stupid. Like, that just makes me want to paint, like, a giant Mickey Mouse and put it in my front yard and be like, fuck you, Disney. So now does it upset you more knowing now that Disney stole a lot of their IP? Yeah, man. Disney, like, he they stole shit. He hated Jewish people. Like, damn. I guess gotta- my level of um, disdain for Disney is pretty much peaking. So I don't know that learning any more bad stuff is going to make me hate them somehow to a degree more. I think it's maxed out. Kind of like but- the Hitler shit. Like, there's no way you're going <laughs> to tell me something where you're like, what? No. He did that. Like, no way, man. I was holding he, up for that guy. He's definitely the worst. Yeah. yeah. So, like, the no, Autobahn, that's not what about the Autobahn? <laughs> I'm like, no, that kind of outweighs everything. <laughs> All the negative shit. I don't hate Disney. Like, I, I'm a huge fan of uh, Disney work. Um, but He seems like a cool guy, but getting drunk with him, you'd be like, dude, you got some fucked up issues, bro. But, yeah, I, I, like, I, I kind of take, take a little exception to, like, uh, I didn't realize Steamboat Willie wasn't something that they just came up with. It was ripped off of yeah. a thing called Steamboat Bill, which was a live action thing. You know, like the yeah. the tune Mickey Whistles is the same tune that's in Steamboat Bill. Um, yeah. And basically all the, you know, Disney movies are uh, taken from European fairy tales that were kind of mm. basically public domain, right? And like it's way darker, like... Oh, way darker. The original like stories, a lot of yeah, would be like horror movies. Yeah, if you if you took the original stories and made them into movies, yeah, for sure. Obviously, they mm-hmm. changed them for more of a family friendly uh, uh, aspect, but uh, um, but just thinking, which is uh, kind of weird because it totally lost like really why those fairy tales were um, passed down through generation to generation. Like it wasn't like like yeah, going to grandma's house. Like, this wolf is going to trick you. Like, no, that shit's going to eat you. So, like, fucking be careful. Sure. Like, three little bears and, like, weird shit that you're like, man, okay. One of the craziest ones is fucking Beauty and the Beast. That shit is about getting old or young girls 
to be okay with marrying, being married off to old men that are the beast. Like, yo, how fucked up is that? <laughs> but like, it's, on, it's just crazy that, you know, Disney built their empire on making tons and tons of money off stuff that yeah. was public domain. Um, yeah. And now, you know, if you went out and tried to make a, a Little Mermaid movie, could oh, you? Luck. Could you? I don't know. It would, it would have to be L I L and like Murma or something <laughs> like <laughs> Little, Little Murma. Murma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's now, oh, man. No. Nah. Even like making a reference or like, yeah. Oh. And now Disney so it, just owns yeah, even yeah. more shit from when this doc was made to now. Like they have like The Simpsons. And, like, stuff that was, like, man, that's really weird that technically Disney owns that shit. But at least they paid for that. Like, they, they acquired those in, in deals. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, yeah, it's not like... It's, they, it's, they, it's crazy that, like you said, how they started from... For sure. ...domain stuff. And then they get to a point where we're, like, oh, we're, like, we're the wolf here. Like, we're taking out every fucking sheep and, like, fuck it. Yeah, but on the topic they, of uh, copyright, like they they didn't do anything wrong acquiring those those intellectual yeah, properties. Yeah, yeah, no, but then they lobbied after they made all their money against having those laws be maintained. Oh, absolutely, how, which is a bullshit thing. Far, like major thumbs down. Yes, agreed. Yeah. How how the fuck like lobbyists? Okay, I know that lizard people aren't real, but I'm pretty goddamn sure if they were, they'd all be lobbyists. Because there's no fucking way those people are human beings. Like, every lobbyist that I've seen for anything is like, oh, this person is, like, just the most evil fuck. Like, you can tell <laughs> this person, like, you need to sell your countrymen to drink radiation. And they're like, I got this. I'll fucking do that shit. And, and like, it's going to kill. Cousin of <laughs> yeah, he is. But, like, he's not an American one. <laughs> oh, right. Okay, fair enough. That makes a huge yeah. difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the scene, um, yeah. the scene in the documentary where the lobbyist is sitting there talking to the kids uh, about yeah. downloading music, and he's like, you know, you could uh, be charged for every song you download. Like, who here downloads music? Yeah. So I'm like, five kids put up their hand, and he's like, no, okay, yeah. now tell the <laughs> truth. And then who here yeah. thinks it's stealing? One kid put up their hand. Um, but like to sit there yeah, and the preach to a group of kids like that is weird. Yeah. You just sold all, like, all those kids are just like, shut the fuck up. Man, the scariest part of that interview or that thing was when the lobbyist was like, if you have an idea, like, that's legally yours. But like, huh, I wish I could own ideas. And they were like, Wait, or concepts. Like, no, he, concept he said he, he wishes he could own the idea of love. Yeah. Fuck you. Like, what? No. Yeah. yeah so I he said, like, one of those kids should have just been in the back, like, fuck you. I'm like, yeah. That's yeah, awesome. he said if you if you write a song about love, that's intellectual yep. property, um, mm -hmm. but you can't copyright the idea of love. But he says he wish he could. Yeah, and then it's under the threat territory, right, for sure. Yeah. But fuck all lobbyists, bro. That's what I'm taking away from this. They're all Cause then, well, because like the the concept of love is shared between all of us for the most part. Then you could refine it even more and be like, you know, love for uh, humans in particular or love for planet Earth. And then you could refine it even more and be like, oh, love for uh, men and women. Refine it even more. Love for women. And then you say, oh, love for women in their 40s. And then you say, oh. I legally own that. <laughs> like you just refine it more and more and more, but yet it's still the general concept. It's getting closer to reality, but it's kind of like pulling a South Park that that disclaimer in the front of their show is gold. Yeah. Like I, why that isn't in the front of literally like get it tattooed on your fucking hand. Cause that seems to protect them to the ends of the earth. And it's, yeah. it's kind of the same yeah. thing is that he wishes he could copyright love but can you even copyright anything then if you can't copyright love like it doesn't really have an end point we just collectively decide where that end point is we stop the slippery slope wherever the fuck we want because we make the rules copyright doesn't exist without people 
so we can just yeah, I was decide. Just thinking that if like society crashes and like there's a thousand people left, and then like you're playing a song, <laughs> someone's gonna come up and be like, "You owe me <laughs> yeah. a dollar." We're like what? Exactly. Yeah. So that's funny that it's something that works if there's a shitload of people. Yeah, yeah. But it's just like society, right? Like if the world is like the three of us, like we're not going to go to war. But then you get like 300 and then like I got 100, you got 100 and Tyler has 100. And they'll be like, man, let's take out fucking Christian. And like it just gets crazy. So copyright stuff. Yeah, it's just so wild how it's just so wide open and it's a lot of like, no, I don't know. We'll just create shit and see. And a lot of stuff, like, it's crazy that you can create something and then no one would really say anything. And then if it gets to, like, a certain monetary value or, like, a certain popularity, then they're like, oh, fuck you. So, so. let's break down uh, his, uh, basically the namesake of the documentary, his uh, Remixer's Manifesto. So yeah, num- yeah, that was cool. Number one, culture always builds on the past. Uh, Christian, yeah. what, what do you think about that? Um, I yeah, I mean, like that's kind of a logical necessity. I can't argue with that because the past came first, and Ooh. like yeah, that's a, a logical point. That's almost inarguable. It's just put into big words. What do what do we think that means? Like, you know, obviously, culture. I guess it means culture evolves based on on what we've done in the past, like. I guess. Yeah, with everything, man. So, number two, the past always tries to control the future. 100%. Like, look at any, like, new music with, like, young kids or, like, any new, like, movement. Like, it, the hippie movement or, like, the fucking beatnik movement before that or, like, punk. Like, there was always government that was like, we need to infiltrate this and have the general public look at it as, like, they're bad. Or like they're like it's not good. Not just like let them fucking run around and do their music. Like who gives a shit? And, and like yeah. So or like with like hip hop's a good example because like it's all just they're all just killers and drug dealers and and like well that's kind of what there's like what they grew up around and what there, it's not like it's not like those dudes would have been like, man, I could have went to Harvard or I could have sold a bunch of cocaine and I choose to sell cocaine. So, like, if they had those opportunities, it's it's just way different. And then they have, like, governments and people that are older that are like, no, you can't do this, you can't say that. Especially in music, like, who gives a fuck? Say whatever the fuck you want. Like, yeah. I, yeah. I tend to agree, and it makes me think of something along the same lines that when the past tries to control the future, um, it it's inevitable, but it kind of comes from a, a dichotomy that you can either turn into those people, or you can. I get. I'll start. I'll start over because it, it takes a little bit of like an absorption that your non-divided you're non-partisan before that why split uh, of trying to control the future or being the future and that difference is one that you learn really subtly i think yeah. growing up and it's just simply a game of plinko wherever you started up on the top of the board and wherever you ended up you hit pegs in your life that bump you this way or that, and you may end up being a lobbyist, fucking over new artists, or you might be a new artist. It's, but it's the same thing. You're yeah. working. You're working on the same sphere of concept, and the fact that the past or the past tries to control the future is kind of a misnomer because nobody from the past is alive in like an existential kind of sense that Walt Disney is literally dead. So what we do with Walt Disney now is whatever the fuck we want, because we're the ones who are alive. I know there's an effort to maintain people's identities through history, but the idea that the past controls the future is 
kind of misleading. It's, uh, it paints this problem that the remix manifesto puts forward of, because these, these points of the manifesto address problems for the remixer. And this second point is a little bit misleading and it, it could be misinterpreted as something that you can't help or that it's a, an enemy or a combatant that you can't actually punch. But you could go right now and punch that lobbyist in the face. <laughs> and you might be okay to do that because of what's kind of relevantly going on in Minneapolis, that when mm. the authoritative it's state is kind of becoming too powerful, uh, just stop them. You might get bloody, but just stop them. All you have to do is go outside and stop them. And it's that easy with music and lobbyists and copyright bullshit too, is that if you don't want it to be around, uh, just do it anyways, because they're not going to arrest you all. They don't yeah. have the taxpayer money. Everyone's in jail. If they arrest you, they, they literally can't pay for it mm -hmm. because that's not how it works. Um, so yeah, this second point, I think, I think it's kind of a big one. The first one I may have just uh, deflected a little bit too quickly, but I think it is that simple. It's just a logical point a starting point, but the second point is really important because that's where you can be divided into supporting the future or being the future. And basically I think it ends on the other hand by trying to make money off of the present and by yeah. genuine human creativity and beauty. I was thinking of this the other day, um, just like super random that, it's wild that like big businesses that are supposed to be on like the forefront of everything, especially like technology companies, like when the internet was put on the table, it's crazy that a lot of those companies weren't just like, Oh yeah, we like, we need to be fully on this. Like we can get our information out there, like record labels and like movies. Cause like, think about if record labels and movie companies were behind like, starting YouTube and shit of like, if YouTube was like, Hey, we'll like, we'll work out some deal. And then like, it would just be completely different. But big business was just like, no, this is the way that we make money. And like, we're not, this is the track that we're on. Like we don't fucking change track. Yeah. <clears throat> and then this other train comes in and just fucking blows their train right off the track. And then they're like, wait, wait a second. And you're like, fuck off. And it was driven by the, it was driven by the people. Yeah. Like in both yeah. cases. It's just like they had the biggest boat in the ocean, and then now there's this other boat that just fucking bang. And then they're like, no, it's not fair. Like, well, fuck you. Like, how the fuck did you not see this coming? You totally had to have meetings where people were like, guys, this is going on. Like, this is what's up. And it, like, reminds no, me no, of, no. <laughs> it reminds me of the conversation that Jay Baruchel's character was having in Tropic Thunder on their way back from the river. When he's talking about uh, the split between VHS, DVDs, and Blu-rays, and <laughs> well, it really all just comes down to porn. Whatever, <laughs> pretty much the industry standard, and he's fucking right because like porn was one of the yeah. first things you could get on the internet, and hmm. <laughs> look at it now. Yeah, everything's on the internet. Like yeah, like literally there have been behind the media. Yeah. Yeah, like how it was like Time Warner not like, man, this porn shit, like this is getting consumed. So like what if we put our stuff on there? Like it's not like, oh, no one's watching this. Like, no, we're just going to use traditional television because we get revenue from fucking Pfizer and PNG because we sell dick pills. But we can't say anything bad about Pfizer or PNG in any of our shows. And you're like, what the fuck, man? Like. It's, it's amazing because everyone's everyone else's back pocket. The uh, the main people who stonewalled these kinds of progressions are the exact same people who want to make the most amount of money off of these kinds of progressions, which is conservative yeah. Christians. It's like and they, they don't want that porn, but they want more and just been like making yeah. bad money. And then now that everyone around them is making, they're like, all right, now we have to have streaming services. And they're all like years behind. So they're so delayed. And I'm like, like, don't even try now. Like, fuck off. So that brings us to point number three. Our future is becoming less free. Oh, 100%, man. 
Look at what's like fucking Alexa and like Google shit. Of how like it's always listening and like our phones are always listening and like yeah. yeah like I'm I'm out. waiting for that day to just sit in a room with a bunch of dudes in suits on the other side being like, Hey Mitch, you said some questionable things about the Chinese government. Yeah. And like <laughs> They might shoot me, but I'll probably chuckle and be like, God damn, I knew this day was coming, but like, fuck, that's wild. All right. So when this point, uh, refer like in reference to, uh, copyright, um, do, do you think it's true? Like, are, are they cracking down? Are they, you know, we see on YouTube where, you know, you put yeah. up a video and 30 seconds later it gets flagged for copyright infringement. Yeah. 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 A hundred percent. And like YouTube's the biggest platform. So they'll be like, you play on our field and play by our rules or go fuck yourself. Like you can go to other streaming services or like other video services. Like Vimeo is really good because it's more like an artist type thing. And they have like the creative control. So you just um, do that. But I think with like big popular songs, there still might be copyright issues. But YouTube's notorious for it. For sure. So, like, if we were to put this on YouTube and we played, like, a Led Zeppelin song in the background, um, we this would get flagged. Right. We should have played a Girl Talk song the whole, like, just quietly in the background. And if that gets flagged, then like, fuck you. Well, I can do something. <laughs> I can do something in post. Oh, man, okay. We, we did it live, so we'll listen to the music right now, then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good <laughs> tune. So, Christian, do you th- do you think copyrights, you know, cracking down and getting harder, or or do you think it's the same as it's always been? I don't know. I don't. I don't really have my finger on that kind of pulse. I think I'm I'm, I'm a bit of an outdated person when it comes to technology in that respect. But I will say that the people most at risk typically are the people who are building these kinds of systems. So, um. The people who can write and design these kinds of copyright algorithms, like YouTube has these auto flags that just take the video down unquestionably if it detects copyrighted material. Um, I think that those same people can also develop ways around it because that's like the essence of cybersecurity is that the best people to get you protected are the very people that could break in. And if they can't break in, well, you're probably pretty good. It's mm-hmm. just a question of who you're going to work for. The downside is, is that YouTube's owned by Google, who's owned by Alphabet, and that's one of the biggest tech companies in the entire planet. So uh, <laughs> is what? the future becoming less free? Um, I don't know. I honestly think that we're in a transition period uh, in, in those terms. I think it's going to be a kind of short one i think we're going to see some real concrete uh categories in the next 10 years um because now the internet is ubiquitous before before i don't even know what before but before right now at least um the internet has always kind of been this open battle zone where you can just enter and start to fuck shit up Mm-hmm. Like Julian Assange style, <laughs> we know for a fact that he mm-hmm. was meddling with U.S. military internet and intranet when he was like 21 years old. And that was like 21 years ago, maybe 30. Yeah. So this is, I think it's coming to an end, like within the next 10 years. I would say it's becoming more free. I just, I see so much different kinds of music, music alone on mm-hmm. YouTube alone. I there, there's no fucking way. It's like, is money coming to an end because we don't have cash? Fuck no. Yeah. It's just changing. And I yeah. think that copyright's going to be the same. I think it'll be a subtle difference in our actual experience of trying to listen and find and keep new music or music in general or media in general. I think it's going to be different, but I don't know that it's going to change a ton. I just don't see the people on mass letting that happen. So I, I guess on the whole, I'd say that the future is trying to become less free, but those people will either run out of money or energy because humans aren't going to stop. There's no way. I found the, uh, the history of the copyright, like pretty interesting. And I kind of made me think of like, I, oh, yeah, when, 
printing press, well, definitely the one story, um, but when printing presses became more popular, like, dude, Martin Luther was like, okay, that's before that, the Bible in Germany and a lot of Europe was in Latin. And then Martin Luther yeah. was like, oh, word, you want, I'll do this. And new Latin and then translated that the Bible into German and then was like, hey, everything that, like, some shit that the church is telling you is kind of bullshit. And that was like the biggest fucking thing. So like, this was like, like he was some remix, like OG remix. Yeah. That's and like, true. that's really yeah. fucking cool that he was like, Oh, like saw the technology and was like, Oh, I could do this. And like, I'm helping people. And like, I think he did it. And like, I don't think he sold them. Like, I think he was just like, no, this is for the people. And then there's like a group, an awesome story of a group of a town of people that took it like really far and were like, all right, we're going to stop paying taxes and like, we're going to do our own thing. And then the ruling government was like, no, you guys can't do this and came in. And then the town spoke like fought the government and like, we're insane. Like taking, um, headstones from the grave and like rebuilding the walls and like doing all this crazy shit. Cause we're like, we're free thinking. And Martin Luther was like, Hey, I told you guys to, like free thing, but like you're taking it a little too far. So it's kind of, it's neat that even that, like with books, it was like, Oh, we're gonna, we're gonna do whatever we want. And then there's ruling parties and the governments and businesses that are like, Oh no, you're not printing that fucking book. Or like, you can't do that. That's a super interesting so, perspective. I never thought about religion. It's all now that, a fucking um, thing, man. <laughs> well, now that you bring it up, the, the remixers manifesto is, it's a bit different. Because, like, old gods and new gods, that's, like, the oldest fucking thing in the book. That shit's yeah, been man. done thousands of times. Um, but the the fact that the future is becoming less free, yeah, honestly, um, like, pagan religions, they had a lot of ceremonial shit, but mm-hmm. you could do whatever the fuck you wanted. Like, there were yeah. no rules. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Basically, just don't murder. And that's it. And even if you did murder, like sacrifice at least. So it was kind of condoned. And like, you can't sacrifice or murder people now. That's crazy. And so like, even in religion, the Remixers Manifesto has some merit. I had never thought about religion before because this is like a a Remixers Manifesto. Like remixing isn't strictly for music. I think that this is just a super relevant topic for the documentary. But yeah, that's a super interesting anything. point. And it's weird, like, music... It's, oh, sorry, Tyler. That's okay. Oh, go ahead. I was oh. going to go on to the it's fourth weird point. It's with music that, like, um, the whole copyright thing. Like, if we were to recreate, like, famous paintings, I don't really know if that's really that big of a thing because, like, I don't... Like, if we did it perfectly, like, I don't... I so don't I actually... Um, I looked into that a couple of years ago just... Totally personally, I was wanting to have a few paintings of like particular paintings, like famous paintings from history that I know and like, but mm-hmm. they're obviously really expensive and I didn't really want just like a print screen from my local print shop. Mm-hmm. So I uh, like reproductions or like how I could buy some of these paintings and yeah, there's like- a company out there, they, they hand paint them all. They're just artists trained in that specific artist. Style. So if you want a Rembrandt, yeah. there's a couple of guys on retainer at this studio and they paint you the exact same Rembrandt as you want. Man, you got to get some Caravaggio. Get that Caravaggio yeah. with little baby Jesus, his dong out, and then like so Mary yeah. Magdalene <laughs> with the titty. That's the one. Put it like right back there. Yeah. yeah. Little baby Dick yeah. Jesus hanging out. Mm-hmm. Totally do that. But I don't yeah, know what kind of limitations there are because they're definitely making money. Maybe not like hand over fist, but but it's not like there's a bunch of studio musicians that are recreating like the Beatles albums or recreating music or True. like it's yeah. so it's just so weird. But that goes back to like you know, you and I, if we were trained classical musicians, we could go and perform uh, a Mozart song and have no copyright repercussions whatsoever. That's public and domain. And get paid because, like, that was a concert. Right. Well, and it's public yeah. domain, right? Like, we could 
go together and record something right now and it'd be fine. We could put it up on YouTube. Yep. Uh, it wouldn't get flagged. Um, yeah. But there's things like, you know, like the happy birthday song where, you know, yeah. it's the stupidest song in the world, yet yeah. someone owns the copyright to it. Man, whatever lawyer got that copyright, like I hope he got the biggest bonus where they're just like, man, lawyer Steve, you just fucking murdered that one, son. <laughs> like you just made us so much guts. How the fuck did you get the rights for a song that is from like the 1800s? Like Jesus, you are the man. <laughs> so move like it, moving on to the fourth point. So this point kind of uh, takes it all the other three points and kind of puts them together. So to build free mm -hmm. societies, you must limit the control of the past. Do you, do you think that, that do you think that's true? I need to rethink what I said about rules number one, two, and three. <laughs> I got to go back to the beginning. Let's do this all again. Yeah, <laughs> Man, this is just an evil cycle where you're like, you think you got the first three figured out, and then you get to the fourth one, like fuck. We got to we'll go. We'll never back. be free. <laughs> we'll never be free. Uh, as, this is an eight-hour podcast. Yeah, as. <laughs> As far as like, uh, you know, obviously it's a pretty simple manifesto um, and it just kind of, you know, it's his thoughts put into uh, a small kind of consumable uh, package. Um, mm -hmm. But overall, like, what do you think about it? It's fucking, it's deep, man. Of like the, with like putting it against every, like anything, like society, like how people are controlled, like religion or like music and like, like anything, like anything that's created, like fashion, fucking cars, like the medicine, <clears throat> the medical industry one was beyond fuck that I was like, dude, yeah. that's so, like science was like, I have, um, <clears throat> I read this book about how, um, like red dye was created and like dyes and how like early Europeans would just fucking lose their shit. If, you came up with like a purple gown. That's why royal, like purple is connected to royalty, like purple and red, because it was really hard colors to get. <clears throat> and this, the color, the dye red, it was like from this crazy beetle in South Africa or South America. But the whole point was that at that time, science wasn't really open source. So like three of us were three different scientists working on the same problem, but I wouldn't be like, hey, Christian, I think I got this part figured out. And I know that you got like, steps four to eight figured out. And I know Tyler has these ones figured out. So let's collaborate and do all of our shit. It was all separate. And it was like hundreds and hundreds of years of people trying to figure out this die. And then eventually it getting figured out, but it was like, man, there had to have been so much shit that was, and then, yeah, what I was getting at was scientists figured out that like, Hey, we need to talk to each other and like work off of it. Like the better for humanity. And then it just gets to a point where we're like, whoa, whoa, wait, we got to make fuck tons of money. So like, I don't really give a fuck about innovation. I mean, like, man, that's, that's crazy that humans got to that point where we're like, no nah, money is way cooler than saving people. So this is my kind of overall encapsulating uh, view on it, on copyright. Stuff like science should be copyright free. There should not be allowed mm -hmm. to have patents on human um, health, I guess, uh, where mm -hmm. we're seeing with these uh, pharmaceutical companies. And I realize it's a business, um, but human health, you know, we, we're lucky we live in a country with uh, um, public uh, health care. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but my opinion is health shouldn't be a business. Human health, like yeah. we should all uh, be working together. As far as yeah. copyright in, in music, I, I don't think I should be able to go out record a, uh, a Beatles song, put it on an album and say, boom, there you go. That's my music. Cause obviously it's not, I didn't create it. Mm -hmm. I don't have any problem with someone sampling uh, a short uh, piece of a song. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I think, you know, I can't play an instrument. Uh, I've tried, it just doesn't work. <laughs> I have no kind of musical yeah, talent. Yeah. I have no kind of musical talent. Um, but if I could go on and make music with, uh, you know, uh, a DJ pad uh, electronically, um, I, th I think there's a little bit of merit to that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you're still creating something, albeit on the backs of someone else. So yeah. you definitely should give credit to, to those people. Um, 
but mm-hmm. I don't think you necessarily, you know, like, so say I, you know, remixed uh, 20 songs into a f- four minute song, you know, I don't think, you know, I have to put a big list of, you know, everyone, especially if you're using a song for, you know, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, you know, mm-hmm. I, I don't, I don't think that's should necessarily be against copyright law. Uh, mm-hmm. th- just my the, encapsulating thought on uh, it as someone who can't make music. <laughs> yeah. One of the the bands that I mentioned earlier, Hood Internet, I found out a lot of musicians through them because they would say like, this song is from this person and this song right. is from this person. Like, and it was a lot of like shit that I was like, I don't like, what the fuck is this? And then like, oh, this is some weird shit. So it was a neat, cool way of finding music. But I don't ever remember with Girl... Well, I guess Girl Talk was a little different because it was way more popular songs. Like, Code Internet stuff is like, man, these are cool songs, but, like, what the fuck is this? Right. Or, like, it might be, like, one popular song and then, like, some obscure hip-hop song that is, like, actually a cool song on its own. And they're like, how the fuck did this person find this? Like, this is crazy. So. And now, but, I don't think Girl Talk has ever... You know, he's ever really face any kind of legal um, troubles. So, you know, is copyright law really, you know, as strict as we as we think it is? Yeah. It just seems that like they're at like record labels, like are just more of a bark than a bite, or to a certain point. And it it could also be that this kind of art was created within that sphere of limitation that in prison, if you don't give me any paints or paintbrushes, I guess I'm going to paint with my shit. I'm just going to make shit art and it's going to have its own kind of merit. So if you don't let me use more than 10 seconds, well, you're going to have a mashup of a bunch of fucking 10 second shit. Mm-hmm. And that's my art. Yeah. It's, um, yeah. Yeah. Imagine there was just a prison for like, uh, artists, that you know, like copyright infringement, like I feel like that would be a pretty cool prison. They're all just like making music and like the the artist is like Christian, the shit artist is painting his little Van Goghs with shit. Seems like it'd be an all right spot. Van Gogh number two. Yeah. So, you know, and uh, Girl Talk has played at uh, you know big uh, festivals like Coachella. You know, so obviously the music industry isn't that against him yeah. um, if they were letting no. him play these huge music and you know he hasn't been blackballed yeah. or or anything like that it would it'd be interesting who runs Coachella or like who owns Coachella because I don't I don't know who that is but it's obviously someone or some company that is like cool with the record industry because that's always like a big thing right for artists to play Coachella yeah so, I mean, it says oh. here, too, that, like, uh, in 2014, for the first time in one of his live shows, um, artists, including Busta Rhymes, E-40, and Juicy J, uh, performed oh. vocals over, over his mashups. Fucking Juicy J. He's one of the, he's one of the dudes from 3-6 Mafia. So, those are, those are artists who obviously um, embrace what he does uh, yeah. and, and don't... Uh, think there's anything wrong with it or else they wouldn't be collaborating with them juicy j won an oscar and it's one of the best oscar speeches ever <laughs> it's all the dudes from three six mafia losing their minds and a whole bunch of scared white people in hollywood going like oh my gosh what's going on and they're just like yeah 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 i'm like oh it's great you should watch it sometime side note it's a good time so yeah that's that, that's crazy that it, it validates it even more. And it's a lot of the, like even the one thing with uh, with that REM band, how they, they were cool with people remixing, but then the record label was like giving people shit. Yeah, Radiohead. And then, and then REM Sleep had to be like, no, let them do their thing. And then it was like, oh, okay. Yeah, that was, so. that was Radiohead. Oh, it was Radiohead shit. Sorry, yeah. I thought it was REM. No. My bad. Yeah. My two my two jokes fell flat. Then. <laughs> Sorry, guys. We'll delete that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, the only thing that I think you know, like where copyright 
you know, really takes a kind of really negative turn. Like when I talked to that woman who was, uh, you know, found guilty and she was ordered to pay 222,000 for yep. having 24 songs that she allowed other people to download from her, from her library. Like that's, that's yep. some kind of crazy precedence. I heard she supports the Communist Party too, so she should probably be in, <laughs> she should probably be in jail. <laughs> yeah, that's fucked. It's fucked that like a human saw that broke down and was like, "All right, let me let that let, let that slide." It gets completely different than that lady like runs a bar or is like running a business where they're like, "Wait, this may be, like an arena or like a venue or something." Right. But like, it's like, yo, it's me and my four kids. Like, yeah, I fucking, it's a little club. My kids and their friends come over and I make them give me money and then they dance around. Like, what the fuck do you think? Like, uh, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. And there's all kinds of stories like that, right? Well, the funny one was the pastor. Right. Yeah. How like, man, how gangster is that though? That he's like, you think he goes to his other pastor friends? Like, yo, you guys got a criminal record? (laughs) Nah, you fucking don't. Well, I do. The fact that the uh, well, actually, wait maybe some of them do and they might not be the weird they probably weirder crimes so <laughs> maybe he doesn't the fact that the label uh, said we're gonna send you some paperwork so you can uh, like uh, make your children implicit like you yeah. can yeah. say no it was my kids that did they're the ones that uh, should yeah. be held responsible dude that's some like North Korean government yeah. shit like all right someone in your household broke the law everyone's gonna die or you need to tell me who it was. And like, what the fuck? Like someone in the government was like, yeah, this guy's going to rat on his kids, right? I'm like, oh, for sure. Yeah, that, that'll that happen. <laughs> like, fuck. Yeah. That's, yeah. That one was funny. Uh, they're like, wait, what? And they would have thought that the dude was a reverend or uh, like a pastor. Like, isn't that in your fucking title? Yeah. Of, yeah. Yeah. So they're like, no, get him. Fuck him. A dirty Baptist, like, oh Jesus Christ! Well, it would have been even better if they said it was like, uh, like Pantera, or like what it, what they would consider yeah. like, uh, like devil yeah. music, the dirty yeah. fucking hip hop. Yeah. Where he's like, yeah, on the weekend, I like to get crazy to some E40, and they're yeah. like, yeah, man, or like I love me some old Easy E. Like, I did not see that coming, and that is amazing. <laughs> like, good for you, sir. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh. Man, it's, yeah, it's it's something. It's cool, too, of, like, how he's, like, it's not over. And, it is, oh, that's another thing I wanted to say was really cool with how they, kids, like, edited some of the film and, like, rotoscoped some of the concert and stuff. Yeah. Like, that, that flowed together really well. And the whole flow of the documentary worked really well from, like, the little animation of, like, going through the history and then, like, old, just old weird footage of stuff and... Yeah, it it worked really well. It was cool. And that really uh, jumped out at me. Yeah, the editing. Yeah. Like, yeah, and it, yeah. and it was cool that, you know, he, obviously he kind of lives by his uh, mantra and made it open source and anyone could just go in there and add a piece to it and collaborate with him, right? Final, like not final thoughts, but uh, overall encompassing thoughts about the documentary as a whole, Christian. What do you think? Um, I guess to, to clean up our short dialogue earlier, point four, um, we need to limit the amount of, or not a free culture is based on the amount of uh, control the past has over it or that we need to. Um, yeah, that kind of like points back to point two. Um, but I think it's also a little bit of point one that that's a logical point that kind of, it's built into the argument implicitly just by the nature of our lives. So, yeah, I I don't really have too much more to say on that. Unless I'm misremembering that point. Can you actually read point four again? I can. So point four is to build free societies, you must limit the control of the past. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what I say stands. Yes. Um, overall, though, um, this was friggin' sweet. I think this was a really good documentary. Overall, it was made really well the story was told from zero percent all the way up to 100 and i came away with it asking a lot more questions than i came away with having answers to previous questions and i have a lot more to think about still and 
that's the greatest thing that you could get from a documentary because they're about life and that means you're asking questions about the nature of your life that's incredibly important for sure man the story of i want to look into it more but the story of when uh the portuguese first came to brazil and then how they were like fascinated with christianity and then they ate the guy oh man oh yeah 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 i want to know that real story i want to know if like yeah i want to know if they were like that or they were just like fuck this dude let's just fucking eat him like some captain (laughs) cook shit as a as a documentary mitch what did you think uh about this one oh it was great man it was really good i liked how it flowed and like it hit on a lot of stuff where it was like what it made you think and yeah the manifesto the remix manifesto like i said like works weirdly stacked against like stuff of like like i said with like society or like how things are controlled <clears throat> and it could be applied to a lot of things where you're like yeah just fucking throw it in and fuck the whole system because the system now is definitely weirdly rigged for sure and like why not like everyone's supposed to have a free shot but or like a fair shot but it, there's no way it's it's not it's not fair so it would be kind of interesting i guess i'm just realizing that i think i'm a communist and <laughs> we need to get rid of everything and, <laughs> dude i always said communism is tight if you're the guys like if we're the three guys at the top we get shit done i don't want to be a factory worker no i, I totally agree with both you guys like uh you know Again, coming from someone with kind of limited knowledge on the extent of copyright, uh, it's a super interesting um, topic to to learn about, right? Because you know we see yeah. it, we we deal with it every day in the back of our lives, like uh, maybe mm-hmm. not uh, head on or or uh, out in the open, but you know we all we can't. I don't think we go through a day without hitting some kind of copyright uh, issue, uh, whether it's what well, it ads. Too. Yeah, whether it's watching yeah. something on on YouTube or uh, you know downloading a a song or, or anything like that, yeah. you know it's it's totally ingrained in our lives. And you know, learning about a little bit of the history of it, and you know, it's cool that it's Canadian content. Us uh, yeah. being Canadians, it's yeah. uh, it's nice to come across a, a good Canadian doc uh, uh, in our list. Yeah. Um. When was the last time you guys illegally downloaded a song? Uh, oh, Jesus. See, yeah, I, I I use Spotify now, so and I pay for Spotify, but I, yeah, so legally cover your ass, Tyler. Good job. I, I that was a trick question, yeah. fucker. I used to uh, <laughs> to DJ weddings or uh, like just parties and stuff like that, and and yeah. when I say DJ, I don't mean remixing. Like again, I said I have no musical talent. I just it was literally oh, I saw that video on YouTube with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was literally like a disc <laughs> jockey. I, I would play songs uh, for for wedding reception, stuff like that. Um, uh-huh. And a lot of the time, you know, like if uh, in the later times when I was doing it, if I didn't couldn't find the song on Spotify, I would I would download it. I you know go to YouTube, yeah. download it off YouTube. Um, but when I first yeah. started, I, I'm not gonna lie, my whole music library was illegally obtained music. Yeah, um, dude, I got a whole fucking hard drive. Yeah, uh, from my old uh, computer that's like all illegal music. Yeah, I I, like, oh, I think crazy. I had thirty five hundred songs at one point. Um, I think I even got some movies on there. Yeah, yeah that's how hot <laughs> I am. What do you got, bro? So yeah, I so oh, man. <laughs> what? So yeah, I mean, I have we've all done letter it. Letter from Warner Brothers saying so cease and desist. What is that shit? Have, have, have you showed me that before? Right. There. Is that it? No, that's no. not. Oh. No, I was like, that's a poem. No. <laughs> it's a shitty poem by homeless guy. Um, I'd be but, sick if they did it in poem form. Yeah. Like, dear Christian. Oh, that would be dope. <laughs> That'd be great. Like, you creative sons of bitches. So, <laughs> so it's great to, uh, to, to get some Canadian content uh, on our list. Um, yeah, when was the last Canadian doc that we've watched? We've I, watched a Canadian one, haven't we? I don't think we have, no. No? Huh? Oh, okay. uh, well, uh, that resonance doc was, that was pretty cool. Oh, was it? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Man, those people are probably losing their shit now with 5G. Like, they probably all just... Oh, they were vaporized, like, the moment yeah. it was turned on. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> 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 vaporized. Yeah. 
the 5G did it. Like, no, it was actually the fucking 9 mil you stuck in your face. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll rephrase that. It's good to get some legitimate Canadian content. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good old crazy Canadian, always good to laugh at. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to to. I think we'd be remiss uh, not to mention kind of everything going on below uh, below us in the states right now. Um, so I just want to so all the riots and uh, and uh, everything like that. Um, so for the next week, I am going to uh, kind of be recutting um, some of the interview with Mary from our Home of the Brave uh, episode. Uh, and uh, nice. putting them to our Twitter account so, so people can listen to those. Cool. Uh, and I think uh, just a reminder to uh, um, to people with everything going on, uh, we have watched a couple documentaries uh, that kind of touch uh, on this subject matter. Um, so Four Little Girls and Home of the Brave uh, are two um, important documentaries I think kind of we, we should all be mm-hmm. watching, whether you're white, black, uh, Asian, uh, whatever you are right now, uh, should be watching that uh, those documentaries to to kind of get a feel for what we should be standing for. I'll cut some some clips from from those two episodes, and I'll cut some clips from those two episodes, and uh, I'll put them to our, yeah, our Facebook page and our, idea, uh, yeah. our Twitter. Page. I'm trying to think of some other. Um, uh, I don't know. It's like the ones that we've talked about before. Like the Malcolm X one was pretty powerful. Yeah, on Netflix. Pretty, uh, and oh yeah! I've been watching so, the uh, yeah. Ken Burns Vietnam doc, and they're like, it's super good. But it's just crazy how every interview, like American soldiers, were like, "Yeah, it was weird. I was in Vietnam, killing Vietnamese, and thinking like, man, not that long ago there was British dudes in America killing Americans, and like, I hate the British, but I'm trying to shoot the Vietnamese and get them to love me, and like, it's just history literally just repeating itself." over and over and like man this is fucked up yeah that's that what were you gonna say christian god damn you fucking derailed me like shit anyway <laughs> i uh i found myself actually on friday evening in the weirdest situation now that i say that out loud it's not true it was fairly normal considering what we do i was uh having my dinner and surfing through you Uh, read it and I was in a comment thread regarding um, what's going on in Minneapolis and elsewhere and someone posted a link to a documentary on YouTube uh, about 9-11 and it's not something that I would typically go for because it's just it's it's saturated honestly and I just I can't sift through uh, facts and fiction and admittedly before this I wasn't super interested um, even in like the humanistic side of it, the way worse oh, shit doesn't happens. sound dark at all. <laughs> well, like way, way, way worse shit happens in way yeah. more worthwhile places in the world. It is a shame, obviously, but yeah. So I found myself watching a documentary called nine 11 and it's, uh, the story of two French brothers who, initially attempted to make a documentary about a boy becoming a man in a New York City fire department uh, engine house. So it's a nine-month probationary like, period. Go on. Like the, that sounds like the gayest porn title ever. You should check it out then. You'll love it. What? They follow this kid uh, from his first interview, uh, presumably until his nine-month probationary period is up, and he's a full-blown firefighter. Okay. But Three months in, he responds to, well, he doesn't really respond to a call. 9-11 happened. Holy fuck. He was not a full-fledged firefighter. And Holy fuck. These two French documentarians, these brothers, uh, they were filming this day. Like, they filmed every day. They had so much fucking B-roll footage of just life in a firehouse. It was ridiculous. But yeah. One of the brothers was out with a gas leak call uh, with a truck that went out early in the morning at like 8 o'clock. And the first plane struck at 8.46, I think. So they're downtown, like two blocks from the World Trade Center, because this is at Ladder 1, which is the first, like, chronologically, it's the first firehouse uh, in New York City. Mm -hmm. So they're fairly close to the downtown core, and they're the guys who go into the World Trade Center for... uh, 
typical calls like the elevator stuck or there's a lady falling. Yeah, it's in their jurisdiction. Yeah, so yeah. they're frequent callers. So they knew the building really well. And this was not related to the trade center. They just had a gas leak call prior. And one of the brothers goes with them to make this call because that's just what they do every day. Then the fucking plane hits. But it's, it's two hours oh, of man. probably the most heart-wrenching footage I've ever seen. Like, this is such a theatrical, cinematically done story. Um, yeah. It's... It's a real marvel, honestly, of documenting history, like documentaries in general. Yeah. The fact that these guys had cameras and that they were yeah. rolling, and so <laughs> not to like spoil it because I just it's insane. It's it's shocking, um, well, dude. Like, how crazy would a doc be if like there was a camera crew on the ground in like Hiroshima or like in Dresden when they yeah. were like a German document? First of all, that German one, they it would have been shot so goddamn sick. But like it would have been so crazy. And then like yeah, this is the same level. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So like this brother yeah. that was in the street at like eight thirty in the morning with this gas leak call, they get into the truck and they go to the lobby of the World Trade Center because they know that they're gonna have to go. So they just go ahead of time because yeah. they're already outside and it's like thirty seconds away. So this one of the French brothers is with a camcorder. He's filming the chief fire brigade uh, guy, fire chief, chief Pfeiffer, I think his name was. Anyways, so he's in the lobby when the second plane strikes and when that first tower that collapsed, collapsed. He was in the building, rolling with his camera and the rest of these fire chiefs. His floodlight for his camcorder was the light that this group of fire chiefs used to save all of their lives. Whoever was they, saved. Firefighters don't have, they didn't have flashlights on them? I guess not. Like, they weren't expecting this, so they just... Oh, I just assumed they had, like, the little, like, tactical. But, yeah, that... Maybe, yeah, maybe it wasn't the only one, but, like, oh, it was man. the only floodlight. So yeah. this brother is in the tower. The second brother was oh. back at the firehouse. Uh, just hanging out with this rookie that they were following. The news hits. He goes outside. They see it all. This kid is just freaking out because he's not allowed to go. All the trucks are gone. Anyways, so this other French brother grabs his camera and he goes out and he films the second plane hitting the tower. And like, it's just, it is this insane spider web of perspectives and of heroism. Mm -hmm. We've never seen anything like it. Both brothers survive. Fuck. Just yeah, because one of them was in the tower, the other was like doing relief effort immediately, yeah. trying to help people. Yeah. Fucking incredible. That two hours, like it went by in a flash. It yeah. was it was the well, most that's, amazing thing. That's like our generations, like JFK, right? Like we could be yeah. fucking yeah, yeah. ninety and be like, you know, like you know where you were when the trade center and like, oh yeah. Like in school. Grade eleven English class. Yeah. Fuck. Crazy. Yeah. Crazy, man. Yeah, it was nuts. Yeah, it yeah. Was a crazy documentary. That's okay. wild. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, pull our, our next one out, and we'll see uh, what we got on top for next week. Cool. Okay, here it comes. Do it. This one was um, surprisingly lighthearted. Uh, rip. Yeah. I was glad. <laughs> Yeah, I was waiting for like a lobbyist to be like, we had to kill Gold Talk. Like, <laughs> yeah, only... yeah. Well, <laughs> so Sony Viacom has only killed eight people. And you're like, ah, oh, okay. That's we got so we bad. got a one week reprieve from something light or from something oh, dark. Fuck so fuck we're back. Man. So we have Taxi to the Dark Side. Ooh, some war shit. Taxi to the Dark Taxi Side. Taxi to yeah. the Dark Side. Yes. Yeah, so it's a Middle Eastern war stuff. I believe it. Uh, like following uh, a division of dudes in no, Iraq or like I, somewhere in the Middle East. Isn't so it? I think the the filmmaker started out uh, just following uh, soldiers, um, but I believe okay, I'm gonna uh, look it up right now. Yeah, it's about a taxi driver who gets just taken away by by U.S. Uh, soldiers, uh, and nobody ever hears from him again. Oh, yeah. oh. So it's about it's about a taxi driver. So let me. Okay, 
I thought it was about something else. My bad. Wow. That super duper is sad. That's way sadder than this. Well, good. God damn it. Probably end up in the Gote, Gote of Guantanamo. <laughs> yeah. So this documentary explores the American military's use of torture by focusing on the unsolved murder of an Afghani t- taxi driver who in 2002 was taken for questioning at Bagram Air Force Base. Uh, five days later, the man was dead. The medical examiner claimed the driver died from excessive physical abuse. Taking this case as a jumping off point, the film examines wider claims of torture that occurred at base like Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo Bay during Bush administration. So this one's another a one. Lead. Yeah. A lead torture. This one's another one from Alex Gibney. We, we've watched one documentary from him some, so far. I have, okay. I think on our list, or I know definitely I have a, a documentary that will definitely sync up with this is um, Standard Operating Procedure, and it's about the torture at Guantanamo. Yeah. And how, like, when shit came out, it got to a certain, like, people in the military, mm-hmm. like, private to, like, a certain level, and then it just got to, like, a, whatever, like it wasn't a general, but someone that was high enough in the military where like legal action just stopped and that person got off scot free and was like, I had no idea what was going on. And then there's privates that are like, I don't, the military isn't a fucking free thinking thing. Like, I'm told what to do. So someone told me to do this. Like, it wasn't like a bunch of privates just woke up and were like, we're going to fucking torture people and like, fuck the Jeeva Convention. They had like their higher ups be like, get this information, fucking do this. And yeah, it's pretty crazy. So yeah, it's another not lighthearted one. So it is available on Apple TV. Uh, Cool. Yeah. So we will uh, definitely be bringing you guys that one next week and uh, go from there. Sweet. Sounds like a ray of goddamn sunshine. Yeah. Well, we we had a, a one week break. So, should be an Uber of a time. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, gentlemen. Thanks. Uh, and I guess uh, we will talk next week. Absolutely. Perfect. See you well, later. Stay safe. Later.